Yep. Okay, so this course is on lexical functional grammar. I said this before, I have a terrible handwriting, so I'm hoping this will work. If you cannot read something, tell me quickly, right, so that I can correct it immediately. Lexical functional grammar, generally known as LFG. It's a theory of syntax that is used both for theoretical work as well as a lot for computational work, which is why I like this theory. I'm somebody who's interested both in terms of theory, in terms of theoretical linguistics, and I've always liked playing with computers. And so having a theory that actually allows you to do linguistic work computationally was something that was very appealing to me. Um, it has a very rigorous mathematical foundation. Look at this. Mathematical foundation. Okay, so it's very well thought out in terms of what the mathematics behind it are. The person who is mainly responsible for this is Ronald Kaplan. And Ronald Kaplan spent a lot of his time at PARC, at the Palo Alto Research Center, and he's now in industry at Nuance. So he's somebody who's continued to be very applied. And he's one of the original founders of LFG, one of the original inventors. The other inventor who's very much on the theoretical side is Joan Bresnan. Okay, and she continues to work within theoretical linguistics and does a lot of things there. She's invented many new directions. Um, for us, it's important that she's the original founder of lexical functional grammar. When was this founded? In the late 1970s, early 1980s. Okay, this is when this theory was first formulated, articulated. Um, most of the action happened at MIT, uh, which is where Joan Bresnan uh, worked and also studied before that. And she studied under Chomsky. I'm giving you a bit of history here. Okay, she studied under Chomsky. She got disaffected with the grammatical framework of the time, transformational grammar, but she was actually one of the people who contributed most, not most, she contributed a lot to that theory. Okay, um, and LFG continues to be informed by ideas that originate with Chomsky. Um, they got together, they formulated this theory. We can. There's more and more to say about that. There's a very early book on this um, called The Mental Representation of Grammatical Relations. Grammatical Relations. I hope that's what it's called. The date is 1982. And it's a big fat book. In LFG circles, you call it the purple book. And this has some of the earliest LFG papers in it. So if you're interested in looking at that, that's quite good to look at. Some of those papers are not, things have moved on since then, but there's one paper in there which is still extremely relevant. For example, so it's not like everything in 1982, now we're 30 years on, 30 years on, everything's better now. That's not the case. For example, Joan Bresnan's article on control and complementation is still a classic. So if you're interested in issues of control and complementation, that's still a real classic to look at. She does more data than many other people. She does more phenomena. And the basic insights are still the ones that we work with. If you don't know what control and complementation is, don't worry. It's on the agenda for this course. So you learn about it. Okay, so that's one of the earliest um, um, publications on LFG. 
In this course, where's my eraser here? We will be working with Uh, mainly one main book, and that is Mary Dalrymple's book, she wrote a book in 2001, she meant it as a textbook, it's a good textbook, and it's just called Lexical Functional Grammar. And for those of you who are in class, it's being made available to you via the library, etc. For other people, you'll have to buy it. There's a new version coming out fairly soon, I think next year or so, so there'll be an updated version. Another book that's relevant is by Joan Bresnan, also in, 19, in 2001. And this one's called Startlingly Different. Lexical functional syntax. Um, this is not really a textbook. It can be used as a textbook. It's very, very good. It's very informative. But it also has a lot of her own theoretical ideas in there. So she has moved the theory on from, well, she keeps moving the theory on. And this incorporates some of her newer ideas. So I'm not using it as a textbook, but it's an extremely good book to look at as well if you're looking at certain topics, etc. Any questions? Any need for more information? No, there's other textbooks on LFG as well, but I think these two are, or the, the way I'm going to be presenting the material, these two are the best. Okay, so. That's some background. The reason I teach LFG in Constance, well, I like it, but the other reason is it's being taught as part of the Master on Speech and Language Processing. Some of you are here for that, in that it is, again, computationally very relevant, and that we can take what we learn here directly and implement a grammar of a language. That's done in a different course, grammar development. Okay, so now, some. how does LFG work? LFG has two basic representations. Okay, one is the so-called constituent structure. structure, also known as C structure, and one is the F structure, actually functional structure, and generally known as the F structure. Okay, I'll tell you more about LFG architecture in a little bit. But I'll start by looking at these two things, okay? So the C structure, what is the C structure for? The C structure is for encoding linear order, constituency, and hierarchical relations. Relations. The F structure is well for grammatical relations and so called functional information. Now let's start look at a, look at a simple example. So let's take a simple example in English. Uh, what simple example should we take? Transitive sentence. I always take the uh, a 
let's take the cat chase the tiger. Okay, now we want to analyze this sentence syntactically. What do we do? What do we know about the sentence? And I'll tell you how it's written. How do you want to start? Somebody has to say something. I'm going to stand here. The cat is a subject. Okay, the cat is a subject. Okay, I'm going to put that information over here. This is going to be my F structure. And we're going to register the fact that we have a subject and that it has a predicate, predicate which is cat. Okay. This is information about grammatical relations, about grammatical functions. So we're going to put it at the F structure level. Okay. We're going to say, okay, there's a subject. It has a semantic predicate. I hope you don't quarrel with that. And in LFT, you generally put semantic predicates in these single quotes. OK, what else do we know? Somebody else had raised their hand. You did. It's, an, it's a noun phrase. Yeah, it's a noun phrase. OK, we'll put that here. So we know it's a noun phrase. And it consists of a determiner and a noun, okay? This is going to be our C structure representation. Okay, so what we have here is we have, in fact, part of speech information, determiner, noun, constituency. This is a noun phrase, this belongs together. We can do the same, I won't waste time for this one. Noun phrase, determiner, noun. Okay, so we know we have two noun phrases. What else do we know? The tiger is the direct object. Hang on, first, yeah. The tiger, is the, the tiger is the direct object, so we can register this here in the same way. Object, pred, tiger. Okay. The predicate is past tense. Okay. This is now design decisions about how you want to do it. We generally have something like a tense aspect feature, and then in there you can say, okay, the tense is past. Okay, what you can see is so these are features. These are values for the features, and the values itself, the values themselves can have values again. Okay, so this is a feature, tense aspect, it has as a value an attribute value matrix. The attribute is tense, the value is passed. Okay, these F structures are organized as attribute value matrices, attribute value matrix in short, AVM. Okay, so the F structures are represented as AVMs. I'll say it again, you have an attribute, you have a value, the value could be a single item, like tense past, so pass is the value for the attribute tense, or it could be another AVM with attributes and values in there. And you can have them in principle <coughs> infinitely recursive. These things are not ordered with respect to each other. I've written them in a certain order because it makes sense for us. Subject first, object second. But in fact, I could have written it the other way around. It doesn't matter. Okay, what else? We're not done with the analysis of the sentence, right? We have a, a verbal phrase or inflectional phrase? Uh, we have a verbal or an inflectional phrase, which is headed by this verb here, chaste. And it contains the object NP, right? This is English. In English, it's pretty uncontroversial that we have a VP. 
In other languages, I find it more difficult, but in English, there is a VP. These two things, why is it uncontroversial? We're saying there's a VP constituent, and you can show that in English, the verb plus the object tend to move around together in the sentence. You can elide them, etc. So there's um, evidence that, these, that this is a constituent here. Okay, what else? I'm just going to put an S on top. We have more attributes for both of the NPs. Let's finish with the tree. So I'm going to put an S on top. Um, in other theories or in other classes, you may have seen there might be an IP here or a CP, etc. We'll just stick with an S right now. Okay? We'll just say sentence consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase, just for illustration. The noun phrase consists of these things and that things. Okay. This is, I've been saying this, this is a phrase structure tree. Phrase structure tree. Okay, and these are actually, it's the way these are done in LFTs by context free grammar rules. So for this little sentence that we have, we would have rules like this. S goes to NP VP. VP or consists of a verb phrase and a noun phrase. And a noun phrase consists of a determiner and a noun. Okay, so where trees come from is no mystery. We write ourselves a set of grammar rules to deal with all the sentences in our language. And from that set of grammar rules, we derive these trees. We figure out the trees, okay? So that's part of what the analysis process will be, that you'll have to figure out what kinds of grammar rules do we need, what kinds of trees do we need, okay? So this is a context tree, phrase structure tree. But of course, we have context. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. We haven't finished this yet, right? This is what was being said, that we still have some more information about the noun phrases. What information do we have? We have number. They're both singular. Number singular. Number singular. What else? What else do we know about this sentence? Person, third person, very boring. Both of them are third person. In English, you can't really see, but you might want to assume case. In other languages, it's easier to see, case nominative versus case accusative. You can put accusative here, because if you substituted pronouns, it would be uh, she chased him, right? So him would be in the accusative form, so we can say, okay, let's call that accusative. What else have we got? No other information? Yeah. yeah the Whether the verb is passive or active, that's right. We have information about, which one is this one? Passive. Yeah, so in general we found this is good to register as passive minus, not passive. What else? Yeah. The verb is transitive. Okay, how do we know that? Okay, and we want to write that somewhere maybe. We haven't said anything about the main verb here. The way you might want to do that, or the way you should do that, is like this. Hang on. Too much of a mess. 
again, you have a main predicate of the sentence, right? There's a main predicate of the sentence. What's the main predicate? The main predicate is chase. And it has a subject and an object. So from this entry here, this is what is called a subcategorization frame. Okay, what it says is we have a verb. The stem is chase. And it takes two arguments, a subject and an object. That's its subcategorization frame. And again, you have these single quotes around it because this is supposed to be a semantic value. This chase is supposed to point you to whatever chase means. Yeah, that something is chasing something else, etc. Okay, so this is known as a subcategorization frame, or you will also often hear subcat frame. Or read subcat frame in the textbooks. Okay, and that's, very that's a very important part in LFG, this subcategorization frame, because that is what you know, how you know what the valency of a given verb is. You actually specify it there. Questions about that? No, clear so far? Okay, so. Subject, object, we know it's transitive. What else? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, you have a question. Um, yeah, regarding the representation, if you have ambiguous sentences, like basically this one as well, because you can, okay, it's the unmarked um, structure, but you could also just put the subject and the ob object the other way around. Do you, all, do you always have to put like both um, representations or how do you okay. do that's a very good question. So the question is, what happens when you have ambiguous structures? So this is not ambiguous, because in English, this is the subject, this is the object. But in German, if you translated this sentence into German, you could, in principle, with the right kinds of noun phrases, it could be either the cat chased the tiger or the tiger chased the cat, and you wouldn't know. What happens then is that you actually have two representations, and you have a different one for each one. Okay? So you would have to... If you're doing it computationally, the grammar will produce both of those. It will give you two trees, two F structures. Okay? Other questions? One, two? Okay. Um, no, I meant um, something like arguments. And okay, so the question is, what about the argument structure? Um, that is also a good question. Here I've given you the argument structure or the subcategorization frame in terms of subject-object, but generally in theoretical linguistics nowadays you talk about agents, patients, goals, etc. Um, this is really basic LFG. There is a level of argument structure that was added later on, or that was formulated later on, um, an A structure. And we'll be talking about that in, a, in one of the sessions. So we'll be talking about that of linking theory. Linking theory deals with things like how you get from agent notions like thematic roles, agent, patient, and how that interacts with subject, object, etc. Okay, so we will look at that in detail um, in, a, in a separate section. In the very, very original LFG, what you did is you actually if you look at the 1982 books, you actually have things like agent and patient here. And then at the same time, it's linked to subject and object. But they didn't tell you 
how these things relate to each other particularly, and that was worked out later. And that was worked out in particularly with respect to Bantu languages, which is also interesting. Okay, other questions? No? We have left out the determiners. Let's see if I have enough space. Um, one could do something like, for our purposes, just say def plus. Not very intelligent. Hmm? Determiner def meaning definiteness. If it was a cat, we could say def minus. In the, um, you want to do something more with determiners. So in, in the grammars that we've implemented, big grammars that we've implemented, we've actually said something like, uh, there's a specifier here, specifier spec. And then we say something about it. We say there's a spec type being a determiner. And um, that it's def in this case, something like that. Yeah, because you also want to be able to do quantifiers, etc. Okay, I think for us though, instead of typing all these things, putting all these things, I'll just say def for definiteness plus, and same down here. Otherwise the F structures get too big and too long. Okay, what else? Maybe mood indicative. Okay, at this point with the F structure, the point of the C structure is really you have your words, you figure out the constituency, you figure out the hierarchical relations, you're done. Okay, with the F structure in LFG, things get much more interesting in the F structure because this is where you're figuring out what the sentence is actually about. So who's doing what to whom? The cat's chasing the tiger, not the other way around. Okay, it's in the past tense, it's indicative, it's not passive. You know more things about the objects that are going on, that they're definite or indefinite, what case they have, etc. So, I mean, both of these levels have a lot of linguistic analysis that needs to go in them. And this one, you need to figure out how much you want to have in there. What's going to be useful information for you? What's use, what needs to be represented for this language? So, but these are the basics of what we've generally done. So things like indicative, also declaratives, that we want to say it's declarative maybe. Okay. If there's anything else you can think of, I think I've covered most everything. Yeah. The main part is really the grammatical relations called grammatical functions in LFG, and then this other information. Okay, so those are the two, two levels of representation. What I haven't told you is I haven't told you how we get these, okay? There's a very, I said LFG was mathematically well-defined, there is actually a projection which takes information from here to here, which means that this F structure information is actually annotated over here. So I'll show you that a little bit and then we'll go through it again though. So for example, I've said that these rules are these kinds of rules here. In fact, what we have Keep those down here so we can check. What we have is we have annotated C structure rules. OK, 
Okay, these are non-annotated. These are just context-free, bare. There's nothing there. But in fact, what we want to do is, and it, it again, it depends on the language that you are dealing with. In English, English is a good example for teaching because in English, you know, this thing here is generally the subject. So what you say is you say something like this. This is an F structure annotation, or it's, it's annotation that expresses functional information. And the way you read it is you say up. Up means the mother node. Up subject is equal to down, down meaning the current node. This is where it gets a bit tricky. So what you have is you have a functional equation that is telling you, giving you the functional description of the C structure tree. You collect up all these equations and you end up with the F structure. But I'll show you how to do that in detail in a different session, because right now it's all about the basics first. But I'm, I'm gonna show you how this sort of works. So what you have is you have annotations like this, up subject is down. With this one we know it's the object, up's object is down. Okay, and with everything else actually, we just pass information along. We're just going to pass information along. And that reads as up equals down. That says take whatever information you have that's associated with the current node and pass it on up. And I'm seeing frowns, let's have a look at it. For example, let's take Chase. The information we want to have associated with Chase is something like, if we look at our F structure, is something like that there is a predicate, it's equal to Chase. a bit smaller. Chase and it has a subject and an object. Okay, and we want to have something also like ups tense aspect is equal to in a little bigger, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I did it wrong too. Okay, let me write it down here so that we know it's supposed to be down here. And then I'll write it separately somewhere else. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm giving you the lexical entries for these verbs. Okay, so what's the lexical entry for this verb? It'll be something like, let me write it over here. Bigger, chaste, what will chaste say? Chaste will say it's a verb, and it'll say it has a main predicate, which is chaste, subject, object. Okay, that's this information. And tell me if I do something wrong. It also has the information, past tense, ups, tense. Nope, I'm not calling it tense. I went for the more difficult option. Ups, tense, asp, tense is equal to past. Ups, mood is equal to indicative. Okay. And ups, passive is minus.
While I'm at it, I actually also need to do subject-verb agreement because there's subject-verb agreement in English. We'll talk about this again, but this is how you would do it. You say, up subject number, up subject num, is three, ups, subject, person, no, I got it wrong, I always get this wrong, ups, subject, person is three, and ups, num, subject, num is singular, okay? Okay, so that's what we have, that's actually all the information we have associated with this. Okay. Now we say take all that information and put it on the VP level. And the VP says take all that information and put it onto the S level. And the effect of that is that all of this information ends up here at the outer level of the F structure. Okay? So we're saying this is the head of my sentence. Up equals down, up equals down. Take all the information that you find here, put it here. Okay, so what's the information we know just from the head? We know this, we know this, we know it has a subject, we know it has an object, and we know these things. Okay, so all of this information is just coming from the verb. Okay, now what's the rest of the tree saying? The rest of the tree is saying the. The will probably just say like something like ups def is plus. That'll be part of the lexical entry of, spe of the specifier. We haven't done anything more complicated. We could, but we haven't done anything more complicated. It'll say that. Cat will say something like, let me write the entry for cat. Cat is a noun. And I'll say something like up spread is equal to cat. This part. We'll also have information about number, singular, person, three, case, nom. Actually, we don't have to put that in there. Okay, so we'll say something like that. Yes? So that information is coming from here. So this says, take whatever information cat has about it, give it to the NP. So the NP at this point has this information in here. And then it says, but by the way, all the thing that's associated with you should be part of the subject. So all that information gets stuck into the subject attribute. Okay? And then the same thing with the object. Tiger will have that same thing, except it'll be tiger and tiger. The will be spec uh, def plus. Put that information together. And here it says, by the way, that information that's concerned with this NP is an object. So put all that information in the object. Okay? And that's how you end up with the F structure. So what is important to know is that LFG is a unification formalism. So what you're doing is you're unifying all of the information that's coming together from various parts of the tree. Questions? Yeah. So how are we going to see that the NP in the subject is an object of the subject information and the NP in the object of the subject is the object of the information? Do you think that we 
Defense Counsel do to raise these as a sentence increase? All he had to do was the cross-check information and the DTMB printed itself in blue and an MDC off-check information? Or can you combine them? Okay, so the question is, how do we ensure that we have the subject and the object information, okay? In English, it's very positional. You actually write it as part of the, um, as part of the phrase structure <coughs> rules. So what you do, rather than having this here, what you end up having is this version. You say S consists of an NP, and by the way, that NP has the information attached with it that this thing has to be a subject, right? And then this is a bit confusing. The up and down arrows make a lot of sense when you write it like this in the tree. It gets more confusing when it's underneath like that, but that's how it's written. And then the VP will say this. It'll say I have a verb and an NP. And uh, this will be my object. Okay, and then the NP will say determiner noun. So we can get rid of this version now. We have our new version. Up equals down, up equals down, right? Okay. So this is what I had up before. These are these are the annotated phrase structure rules. Okay, other questions? Is that clear? Okay, so now why this? Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the motivation of why LFG got to do these things. There's a whole bunch of reasons. You can go read about it in the 1982 book when they first form formulated LFG and in subsequent papers. But I'll just like to give you two examples of the why, which means I'm going to erase all of this. Yeah. So LFG is very special in that it has this division of labor between trees and functional information. There's, I think, no other theory that does it this way. It has a very, very explicit separation. Why is that separation that way? Well, the idea was that when you looked at language after language after language, the interesting part or the language universal part that what what language is shared seems to be on the f structure side whereas the c structures can vary quite wildly so um, one of the examples or one of the languages that was worked on very early on in lfg was walbury this is how you spell walbury australian language it's worked on by Jane Simpson. Okay, and you have Walbury is quite wild, like a lot of these Australian languages. Uh, where is my example gone? Here. Um, and also in the Dalrymple textbook, it's on page, you can read about it there, on page 65. So you can look it up there. So in Walbury, and I'm sure you will all understand this, you can say things like 
Kurduf. I don't speak to Walgri. Okay. And there's only one part of this sentence that I know by heart. And I'll tell you which one that is. Okay, so I can tell you which part of that sentence I know. That's this one. This is the ergative case. It's because I like case. The ergative case has a complicated theoretical discussion around it for your purposes. It marks agents. Okay? So, what does this mean? This means child. This is a morpheme that expresses dual. It means two of them. Then Kapala is present. Um, present. It's an auxiliary that does present tense. Then this is dog. And this is chase. And this part is non past. And this is small. And this is what? Dual. Dual. Okay, so what do we think the sentence means? I've given you the glosses. Yeah? The children, two children, two children. Dual and Almost. Yeah, good question, huh? Okay, so. Non-past and past. Not past. The two, that's right. And we know the ergative marks the agent. So the small is also the children. So this part and this part belong together. Yeah. Are in English present tense is a bit weird. Are chasing a dog or the dog? Okay. So Walbury allows for very very flexible word order. They're not so bothered with constituents. The main thing is that this thing, the present tense, the auxiliary needs to be in second position. Everything else they seem to be quite flexible about. And how, would you know, how do we know which pieces belong together? Well, by case marking. Okay, so we know that this means the two small children are chasing the dog. So whatever tree you make for this is going to look very different from the English tree, right? Or from the German tree. But what you want to do for both of these, whether it's English or German or Walbury, is you actually want to have a F structure that says what? You want to say pred, chase, subject, object. You want to say the subject is the children. And I'm going to abbreviate this a bit. Pred child, number plural. Case ergative. So I'm leaving out the small two, whatever. And that those children are chasing the dog. Case is absolutive, actually, they call it. Okay, so for whatever language you have, right, in whichever order it is, 
whether it's English or Walbury or the German version or the Urdu version, you want to have this kind of predicate argument structure and you want to have that information about it. You want to have information that it's not past tense, right? So you would have to, you would have something here that says tense aspect, tense would be present, something like that, right? And you'd want that to hold for all the languages. So that's one basic design decision why LFG decided to separate it out. It said at C structure, let the languages do what they want to do, whether they're strict about constituency like English is or not like Walbury is. Do whatever you want to do. At F structure, try to keep things as universal as possible. So this should be the level of comparison, really. This is where you want the information. And for the semanticists among you, this is what the basis for semantic interpretation is then, right? Because here you know who chased whom and what their other properties are. Questions? The semanticists are used to trees and of doing semantic interpretation from the trees. This gives you a lot more flexibility. Okay, so I'll let that sink in for a second. Because this is one word and it's marked with the ergative and the ergative says, I'm marking the agent, the subject. Okay, that's how you know. So in these languages, case marking is extremely important. And then you see the yeah, so this is all, yeah, so this is all one word. So this is small dual ergative, okay. Okay, so design decision, keep C structure apart from S structure so that you can let languages vary in terms of linear order, constituency, whatever they need to do there, but keep this level as similar across languages as possible. You want to do semantic interpretation of that level. Okay, then the other topic is I've talked a lot about subjects and objects, etc. Um, and the question came with agents and patients. And these grammatical relations or grammatical functions, as they're called in LFG, are really a very, very basic part of LFG. And the reason for that is also in the founding of the theory. I can erase this now, right? Yep. So there's one thing that's very important to LFG, which is the lexical part, as you might have gathered from the name, lexical functional grammar. The other part is functional. And the reason for that goes, can be illustrated very well with the passive, which was one of the major, major things where arguments, what arguments were about in the 70s and early 80s. Can you do the passive properly? How should one do the passive? and LFG had a certain take on it. The take on it was not invented by itself, but um, was due to some other work. But I'll show you sort of what the history was so that you can try to understand that. So one of the um, really basic insights of, of generative grammar is that you have sort of a, a base sentence. That's not a B a base sentence and the, int, the sentence usually taken is, well, let's just take our, our usual one. So what do we have? The cat chased the tiger. The usual sentence they have is the farmer killed the duckling, but let's not be so Violent, only half violent. Okay, so this is the active version. And then the realization was is that you could, or the way thinking of it, you could take this base 
sentence and you could transform it into other sentences. For example, the passive. Okay, so you go from there and you can see, you can um, specify some rules and tell you how to get from the active to the passive. The passive is, of course, the tiger was chased by the cat, where the cat is actually optional. And you could do that. You could also do a question. Um, what did the cat chase? Okay, and more and more things like that. So what transformational grammar at that time was concerned with is saying, okay, I have a base sentence, and I know there's various versions of the sentence, questions, passives, other types of alternations. And what they were trying to understand is how to formulate the rules that will get you from here to there to there, etc. okay? And the rule system got very, very complicated. The kinds of rules they had back then, 70s, was something like this. You said, okay, let's call this NP1. So let's schematize this whole sentence. NP1, verb, NP2, that's your basic sentence. That can be transformed into something like by, I have to make, make sure I don't get it wrong. NP2 comes in the front. Then we have an ox. Then we have a verb in past form, past participle form. And then we have a by, and then we have the NP1. Okay? So these are the kinds of rules that were written back then in transformational grammar. And you had a very complex, intricate rule thing, um, a collection of rules. Okay, now, it's 40 years later. You look at that, you think, oh, that's very English-specific, okay? Okay, well, if this is very English-specific with, you know, the ox here and this kind of morphology here and the by here, well, what do you do instead to capture what passive is about? And there was a very famous paper by, uh, let me forget their names. No, I don't forget the names. I forget their first names. Um, by Perlmutter and Postal in 1983. Perlmutter, David Perlmutter and Paul Postal. And they looked at language after language after language, and they were trying to understand how to characterize the passive generally. Okay? And they tried all kinds of things. They said, well, maybe case. Maybe you could say something like, if we have a sentence, then we could say, okay, we have a nominative and an accusative. And then that accusative could turn into a nominative, and this could become some kind of biphrase or oblique or something like that, or adjunct. So they tried something like that. That didn't work either. Can you think of why? It works nicely for German and Latin and English. It won't work for Walbury. If you remember the example we just had up. Why? Yeah. Right, so, you'd, so the, for the Walbury example, it wouldn't have worked because we don't start out with nominative accusative. We have a different case marking system. We have ergative absolutives. You have to write a different rule. So they, they didn't like that much either. And what they came to, and they did it within their own theory, which is relational grammar. And I won't get into that anymore. But what they said, the real generalization back then is what they said real generalization is at the level of grammatical relations grammatic 
vertical relations. So what they said, the way you should think about the passive is that you have a verb with a subject and an object. And what the object does is become a subject. And the subject either becomes an oblique, so a prepositional phrase, or it becomes an adjunct and can therefore not be realized. That sort of depends on the language. Okay, and that works for this quite well. Subject, object, the object becomes the subject, and the old subject becomes a prepositional phrase. Yeah? So this analysis works for pretty much all languages except that then you want to talk about agents and patients rather than subject object, but we're in the 1980s here, okay? Okay, and this is, uh, so rather than talking about structural configurations like they were doing here, this is a structural configuration, you don't see here really whether this verb is transitive or what kind of verb it is. They talked about, or LFG took it to mean, to be a generalization about lexical properties. Okay, why? We can take something like this. Um, the girl had a tiger. Okay. This fits the scheme, that structural scheme, right? We have an NP1. We have an NP2. And we have a verb. It's exactly that structural scheme. So if we apply the passive rule, what should we get? We should get smiling. So this is not really a good sentence, except for in a very particular interpretation. But it's not the passive, right? So this rule actually can't apply to any configuration that's like that. It has to be lexically relativized. So it's only certain verbs that can do it. Okay, mainly agentive, ditransitive, transitive, ditransitive sort of verbs. Right, so you're saying, okay, it's a lexical property of verbs. So you can't have a structural configuration that just goes and fires, but you need to make it be about, um, about lexical properties and you need to make it be about grammatical relations. Okay, questions? Yeah. Do we have a clear object in Walbury in the Walbury example? Um, yes, because the dog was, so you're asking, was it marked in the accusative? Yeah. No. Um, Walbury has, I, I keep trying to avoid this, this discussion. Uh, <laughs> um, Walbury is an ergative language so-called ergative language. And there's many, many complicated discussions about this. But basically what this means is that your subjects are ergative. Actually, it's your agents. And your objects are marked. They're actually not marked. You don't have any case marking. And this has often been called the absolutive. Okay, which you can also use for subjects. But as soon as you have an ergative, you know that's the subject. And the other thing is the object. Okay, so within that system, it's clear. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. So the question here is again, so then 
if we don't have annotated phrase structure rules like we had before with a subject with S NP VP and the NP says I'm the subject and the VP says I have the object in me, what happens is that the information actually comes from the case marking. Okay? Um, I've done that approach for Urdu, which also has fairly free word order. And for Australian languages, Rachel Nordlinger in 1998 um, proposed something called constructive case where basically the ergative will say whatever I'm attached to is the subject. Okay. There's, you have to do it technically a little bit differently from what I showed you. But basically that's what the ergative is saying. The ergative is saying whatever I'm attached to that thing is the subject. And then the other case markers can do similar stuff. Yeah. So it's a very flexible system in that you don't have to put everything in the phrase structure trees. You can put some information in the phrase structure trees where you want it to, some in the lexicon, some in the morphology. It all flows together. Does that make sense? Yes. Would you expect to find languages where you have a mixture of the two systems as well? Yes, and you do. Yeah, so that works. <laughs> works well. Yeah. Okay, we only have a little bit of time. The next, is this okay now? Yeah. The next topic is to look a little bit more into these grammatical relations. So I've talked about subject-object so far. I keep mentioning oblique sort of on the side and adjunct. Um, I'll need to explain those in a little bit more detail. They are explained very well in Dalrymple's chapter two. So you can use that for background reading. So I'll do that next time. What I'll do, what I'd like to finish up with right now is three LFG basics. You just have to know them. And then I'll demo them on the computer so that you can see them too. So there's some principles. Basic F structure principles. And these are principles that ensure well-formedness of F structures. Okay, one is the principle of co coherence and the other one is completeness and I'm putting them both down at the same time so that I don't make a mistake. So completeness is about if all the grammatical functions and this is not the official statement you can find the official statement in Mary Dalrymple's book uh, but I'll just explain it so that we can understand it simply all the grammatical functions also known as GFs specified in a subcat frame must be present. So the idea is if you have something like uh, the cat chased the tiger, that's good, but I can't just say the cat chased because you want to know who or what. Okay, And that is because chase has in it specified subject object and the system was only able to find the subject. Okay, and then it says where's my object? This F structure is incomplete. Coherence on the other hand is 
no more GFs than specified in a subcat frame should be present. So the example here would be, uh, what would be a good example? The farmer fill the tractor. The farmer fell the tractor, not good because, why? Because fall, the lemma fall, will be intransitive. You'll say, I want a subject. And you go through and you say, okay, I got a subject, good. And then you say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? I have no specification for this. And the phrase structure rules will tell you that it's supposed to be an object. So then this F structure will end up being incoherent yeah, because you have one extra argument hanging about that you don't know what to do with. Okay. And then you have, third one is consistency. Values of features, values of attributes must be consistent. So this is where unification comes into play. So as you're putting together information from various parts of the tree, the morphology, the lexicon, you have to make sure that you're always unifying the same kind of value. Otherwise, it will give you a clash. And I'll show you that in a, in a minute. OK, so these are just basic principles that you need to know about conditions on F structures. Obligatory knowledge. OK, so now I'll demonstrate those just that you see them at work. And then we'll be done for the day. Okay. So I've already called up a grammar. It's a very, very small demo grammar that is just used to illustrate some stuff. It's done with a grammar development platform, XLE, which we also teach here in Constance. And I'll show you the inconsistency one first. So I'm going to try and parse boys' sleeps. That's bad, right? Why is it bad? Let's see. Let's parse it. Oh, no, I just hit return. We get a tree, boys, sleeps, that's good. NPVP, basically just like what I had on the, on the um, blackboard. And we see a little box around the S here. And if we, this is actually showing that here. And it's saying this F structure is inconsistent. The tree is fine, but the F structure is inconsistent, why? Because sleep says, I want a singular subject. We can look at that. I can click on here and I can say show F structures. So this is the information associated with a verb. So we have a four here and a three here. These are randomly assigned by the computer just to keep track of which node is which. But we can see the information from nodes three and four is this. Sleep, 
is intransitive, needs a subject. The subject should be singular and third person, and the present and the tense is present. Okay, what's coming from boys? Let's click on that. Show F structures. So the information associated with the nodes one and two is that there's a boy, predicate boy, number plural. Okay. Now the information goes up here, comes together at this at this node, and here we then have a clash of features. Yeah. Boys is saying I'm plural. The verb is saying I need a singular subject. And so what we have is unification failure right here, and the F structure is inconsistent. Okay, so that's one of the ways in which you do well-formedness. Let's try a girl devours. What's going to happen there? What should the system do if it's working right? The object is missing, and that means, look over your notes, <clears throat> this is an incomplete or incoherent F structure. Which one? Incomplete. Okay. So we parse that. We get a nice tree. We get a box around this verb. Let's look at this box. Say show F structures, and it says incomplete. Because subject, devour has a subject and an object, and it knows it's not going to find the object. Okay. And then the other one, a girl sleeps the banana, will be, yeah, incoherent. Again, we get a very nice tree. It has no problem at all with the tree. It's a very good tree. But it has a problem with the F structure. Sleep is an intransitive verb, subject. And it says, okay, I'm going to be able to find my subject. But I have this extra object lying around that I cannot do anything with because it's not licensed by the subcategorization frame. Yeah? Okay, and I wanted to show you these so you can actually see how this information is all being brought together in the trees, how it's actually being calculated. Questions? No? Okay, then next time we'll do more basic in terms more basics in terms of grammatical relations and then slowly start moving on to bigger concepts. Okay. See you next time.